I think what happens in an elevator on my own is kind of like a metaphor for what this whole thing is about. So as soon as the doors close, I'm just intensely aware of being cut off from everything and everyone. And it's almost like a kind of death. I think there's a huge part of me that still thinks if, if, if you were to open me up and look inside, you'd find something terribly wrong that's not fixable. She walked towards you with her head down low. She wondered if there's a way out of the blue. Around 250 million people across the world suffer from an anxiety disorder of some kind, according to the World Health Organization. Researchers at Cambridge University have found that more than 8 million people have an anxiety disorder in the UK, and women are nearly twice as likely to experience anxiety as men. And if you happen to be a woman, and under 35, you're particularly prone to anxiety. For the last 10 years, I have struggled with anxiety and panic attacks. I've been opening up more and more about my anxiety disorder and the things that I find difficult. Like travelling on the tube, for example, on my own. Solitude only makes my anxiety worse. My fear of being alone has a name too, monophobia. I made the decision to move into an apartment with um, a support worker or slash carer, somebody that could be in my house with me um, so that I wasn't alone because of my struggles with anxiety. There she waits looking for a saviour Someone to save her from a dying self Always taking ten steps back and one step forward She's tired Anxiety for me has meant that I'm less free. Things that I took for granted maybe 10 years ago, like going for a walk or sitting and reading a book in a room on my own. Quite simple things become more complicated than they need to be. Initially it was horrendous on the road. There wasn't time or space to explain to anybody. Not being able to sleep in a bed on my own. There was the embarrassment of that, so I was always trying to cover up. Oh, she's forgotten something in the room. Why does she need someone to go with her in the elevator? That's a bit weird. Or going to the toilet. The toilet's just there. Why does she need somebody to... So... I had a panic attack one time at Glastonbury. I remember looking down at the keyboard and being like, mm, is there a way to disguise this? Because this could be it. Like, it's one thing to be around friends and family, it's another thing for, like, the world to see it. Any moment now, I'm going to be seen and you're going to be put into a mental institution and there's nothing you can do about it. That, that's the fear. first time I spoke about a panic attack to my mum and she was kind of like, <laughs> have a hot meal, have a bath, get to bed. And I was like, that's not really it. Round the mountain, all got children run. from a very expressive family. You feel things very deeply, you experience things very deeply, and I think somewhere along the line, I just haven't quite made the transition from having a specific role within a community of, of people to 
existing on my own. I think it's sadly like a really profound lack of trust in myself. I'm not the only millennial in the public eye dealing with and thankfully talking about their struggles with anxiety. Singers Adele, Ellie Goulding, Zayn Malik, YouTube star Zoella, to name just a few fellow sufferers. The worst thing about my anxiety personally is when it comes to being given opportunities, um, now you guys won't know half of the things I've been asked to do that I've set, had to say no to because I've been scared, I've been like afraid that I'm gonna have a panic attack. The more we talk about mental health, the more normal the topic becomes. We do not want prejudice and fear to stand in the way of people getting the help that they need. Eleanor Morgan is a journalist and trainee psychologist. She wrote a book called Anxiety for Beginners, a personal investigation. She was 17 when she experienced her first panic attack at school. So what did it feel like? The most prevailing thing was that I felt like I was going to throw up. But also this sensation like at the back of my head that my, my skull was about to crack like an egg. Um, it was just this internal pressure um, that I, I'd never felt anything like it before in my life. And the, the only logical explanation that I could kind of get to at the time was that I was about to die in a skanky toilet cubicle at school. You did a lot of research for mm. your book that you wrote. Ultimately, there isn't a cure for it, but what we do have, with the knowledge that we have of, of how the brain works, is a wealth of things that we can do to manage it. For me, I know that there are things that will make me feel better and that I really feel the impact of when I don't do. Exercising, not sleeping, all of those boring things that you read in leaflets in the GP. Pam, well, she's changed my life already. Yeah, like, she does. She's five minutes. How <laughs> yeah. has she helped? It's the routine. It's the responsibility. You know, there's absolutely no choice in the matter. I have to take her out. Yeah. I don't think I ever feel as calm or as centred as when I'm lying in bed with her and she's, like, half asleep and I can feel her heartbeat. So there's... A lot of stigma around anxiety. I know that when I was younger, certainly, I was silent because I was scared of what people would think. Mm. People are going to think what they think, regardless of what you say. The thing that we have to work on is our own resilience and what we understand about what's happening to us. We also have to remember that we have more language about mental health now than we ever did. Um, the way that stigma has improved has meant that more people recognise their symptoms as anxiety. One of the most galvanising things that I've learned is our brain's ability to change. And it's so difficult to believe that when you're in a moment of despair. But over time, is learning that we can change the way we think, that the thoughts are just thoughts. You can counteract your own thoughts. Even just hearing you voice that, that thoughts are just thoughts, mm. gave me, in just in that moment, such a sense of freedom. Really? Yeah, because they don't feel like No, <laughs> they don't. <laughs> they feel like death sentences that mm. you have no control over. Mm. So, why is anxiety an epidemic sweeping through Generation Y, those of us born in the 80s and 90s? What have we got to be so anxious about? I'm hoping Marjorie Wallace, who founded the mental health charity SANE, might be able to tell me. Well, the people contacting us, they feel that there's somehow no world that they belong to at the moment. It's fragmented. They don't seem to have the secure relationships with role models, with families, with real friends. A lot of it's the relentless media and social media. They can't get away from it day and night, a lot of comparisons with celebrities, comparisons with peer groups, the expectations that you're going to have a career, you're going to have a family, all the things that are demanded of you at that age, and really no rest from those demands. What can we do about it? Well, the first thing really is to talk about it. In fact, like you are doing openly, so that people aren't afraid 
of mentioning it because the more the fear, the worse their inner fear becomes. Certainly since we've been making this documentary, speaking to people or just looking into somebody's eyes and hearing back words to the effect of you can be helped in this way and lots of people suffer in this way has been huge for me because I don't think I, other than therapy, which of course is really important, in my everydayness of life, I don't talk about it often. Journalist and writer Bryony Gordon is passionate about normalising mental health issues. She wrote a memoir called Mad Girl, documenting her experience of mental illness. I was really ill. I've had um, kind of chronic obsessive compulsive disorder since I was 12 and depression and anxiety and eating disorders and all of these things. And um, I would started writing about my experiences in The Telegraph and I'd had this incredible feedback. It was like the floodgates opened and loads of people going, me too. And I realised it's really, really normal to feel weird. Last year, she set up Mental Health Mates, a walking and talking network where members can be heard without judgment. The thing about walking is that you that you kind of tend to get into a rhythm together and you see people who at the very beginning they turn up for these walks and I think if I don't go over there and grab that person now and give them a hug they're gonna leg it. People talk about half the battle being getting out of the house in the morning but for people who suffer from anxiety and depression it is the battle and that thing of on a Sunday morning then by 11.30 saying oh, actually I've done <laughs> I've done a two mile walk or whatever and I've met people and you think I've really achieved something with my day. I know that a lot of my anxiety manifests from a loss of belonging or a sense of sort of being so isolated and on my own. But I, I think that's so refreshing to me and, and the idea that you're not static because mm -hmm. a lot of my suffering comes from feeling totally rigid and Trapped. stuck. Yeah. Um, like, I can't move um, mm. for fear of collapsing or breaking, mm. whatever it is. So, yeah, that's exciting to me. I'd love to come. Come along. I want to do, like, a mental health march on yeah. World Mental Health Day, maybe in October, yeah. and, not, and just get everyone to come out and go, I suffer and yeah. it's fine and yeah. I'm me and we're not invisible yeah. anymore. Yeah. And I think yeah. the moment you do that, it just, it all changes. Yeah. This is something that doesn't have to be a prison for me, for other people. Um, because the more it's spoken about, the more we can figure out how to move through it together rather than on your own. With my anxiety, I'm still at the stage where I'm working with a therapist to go to the root of things, speaking through things, making them tangible, this has been really important for me. I also take antidepressants. That's something that for me was like a big taboo thing. So I was like, I will not medicate this thing, but actually that's helped manage my moods, which puts me in a better place to make progress. I try to be kind to myself. I've started now to, to pat myself on the back for the smallest achievements. <laughs> You know, like, if I walk to the shop, if I walk to the shop and get a bottle of water, it's like, hey, that's pretty huge. Recently I took um, the tube on my own for the first time in a few years. You know, for me that was really special because that's something that was, I couldn't conceive of doing a few months ago or a year ago. And if I can move into a new place successfully and live on my own, that will be pretty life-changing for me. 
I try to practice celebrating the fact that I'm me and there's not another Laura and Vila and that means that it's good that I'm here. <laughs> I have managed to not just survive, but like change the world through music whilst feeling like I'm at the end of myself, which must mean that it's possible to um, move past it. <laughs> <laughs>